also to provide policy prescriptions that encourage free market uh, flourishing in our urban areas, which as we know, they do not now. And uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, I found out that Scott was in, in part of his travels around the country, which he will describe, uh, that he is in Baltimore and staying in Hamden, I believe, uh, for a few weeks, I guess. Yeah, uh, a month in each city. Yeah, and he's been to Houston, he's been to Puerto Rico, uh, and all over, and I urge you to sign up to the Market Urbanism Report uh, on Facebook if you haven't. And he also has a webpage, scottbuyer.org, uh, where you can read his articles in Governing Magazine, uh, in Forbes and uh, quite a, and quite a few other publications. He's a very accomplished journalist, and uh, he really is, as I said before, plowing the same ground we do. So uh, when you need a slide advance, just tell me, and, and and we'll do it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to present Scott Beyer. Thank you, Joshua, and hello, everybody. Um, I guess I'll get right into it. Uh, so yes, I'm I'm on a cross country trip, and that's why I happen to be in both. I actually just happened to be in Baltimore during this conference, and uh, so it was a little bit serendipitous that I ended up being here. But um, yes, I'll just go directly into uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So. My name is Scott Beyer, and I'm a journalist who uh, owns the Market Urbanism Report and writes columns for Forbes and Governing Magazine and a, and a number of, and does freelance gigs for a number of other publications around uh, mainstream publications. But about three years ago, I started two major life projects. So I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia, and the first one that I started was a three-year, 30-city cross-country tour where I'm from Charlottesville and I drove down to Miami and I decided I'm gonna live for a month each in 30 different cities. So this was the fall of 2015 and you can, uh, Joshua, you can actually slide to the, that's the route that I've been taking. I've been going, uh, you'll see there was detours in Cuba and Puerto Rico, but, that, but those, weren't the, <laughs> those weren't the main stops. Mexico as well. and. The, uh, and so I've been going clockwise around the country, living for a month each in 30 different cities to write about urban, urban policy reform in the United States. So I started in Miami in October of 2015, and I went through the South and the Southwest and up the West Coast, and Seattle was effectively halftime. And then I went through, I went back East through the Intermountain West, the Great Plains, the Midwest, the Mid-South, and then the final, the final fifth of the trip, which is what I'm on right now, is up the Acela line of Amtrak, uh, up the East Coast. So going through DC, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Boston, and New York City. And New York City is the final stop of the cross country tour. That's gonna be December of 2018. So, so yeah, um, and, and again, the, the point of doing this trip is to cover urban policy reform for different magazines in the country, uh, around the country and also write a book about urban policy reform in the United States and how, it, how free market policies can revive U.S. cities. Uh, the second big project that I started uh, was about halfway through the trip, I started a, a policy organization called the Market Urbanism Report. And I think you can switch to the next slide. That's the company logo. And that was kind of just to advance some of these ideas that I'm talking about around the country. Uh, you know, I thought that we needed to get more publicity around some of the, some of the issues that I was exploring. And so this formal policy, or this formal advocacy organization is meant to bring more publicity. And at this point, it's more of a, it's kind of, a combination of a blog and a number of active social media threads 
and it's been around for about a year now. It publishes daily articles. But really moving forward, I'm writing a business plan for it right now, and I'm really trying to begin fundraising for it and turn it into a formal organization that has full-time staffers and, made, and a marketing budget and fundraisers and things that are really going to turn it into more like a think tank than just a blog. Because the way I look at it is that we have a bunch of organizations like that that call for more regulatory outcomes. We have things like the Congress for New Urbanism and Strong Towns is kind of, I, I would think Strong Towns is a little bit of an ally and maybe not a complete ally to market urbanism. Um, we have Smart Growth America, which of course calls for all kinds of regulations. So we have, we have, we have, we already have a bunch of urbanist think tanks. The Urban Institute would be another example, very, very much of a, I would think, a left-wing think tank, uh, that are calling for more regulation and government policy in cities. And so I think there needs to be a, a countervailing think tank like the Market Urbanism Report that says, no, we actually need less regulation, and we need more free market policies. Uh, and so. In the next, in the coming years, you're going to be hearing a lot from me, and and really, of the progress that the Market Urbanism Report is taking, and the kind of measures it's taking to become a formal policy organization. So I just want to go into uh, some of the things that the Market Urbanism Report is going to be covering, and it really it really breaks down into three different categories: the the issues that we cover, housing, transportation, and public administration. And Joshua, we can go to housing first. So there we have it. Uh, deregulate land to make housing cheaper and let people live where they want rather than having government's predetermined settlement patterns. So the general, the general premise here is that we need less regulation of land in the United States. We, I don't think that zoning should be a thing. Actually, I think that Zoning should be overturned by the Supreme Court, as it, as, as it was actually, it was uh, approved by the same Supreme Court in 1926, and I think that that has been a very uh, bad policy, and zoning has metastasized beyond what its initial, original purpose was to become something more, uh, far more regulatory and controlling of society. And I think generally that if we did not have land use, or to very nearly the degree, the land use that we paradigm that we have nowadays, we would get a much better sense of consumer demand. How do people actually want to live? Where do they want to live? Uh, what kind of housing do they want to live in? And what do they, how do they want to use their housing? And the, and the thing, and we don't have any of that nowadays. Instead, we have zoning codes that tightly confine where people can live and how they have to live. And I think that First off, that's a, that's a breach of personal freedom and consumer choice, but it also has a lot of tangible uh, backdrop, uh, negative consequences to it in the sense of housing shortages. You know, a, a lot of the reason that places like San Francisco and Boston and Washington, D.C. have housing shortages is because they have regulatory regimes in place that prevent the necessary amount of housing supply from being built on core urban land. And so I think it would both be better for society and it would be better for original ideas of personal freedom to have less land use regulation. So the second principle is transportation, advocating that all transfer, transportation forms become self-sustaining by operating on user fees and a market-based pricing system. So again, it's not propping up any one transportation style with taxation, through taxation. Uh, it's not giving subsidies to roads. It's not giving subsidies to transit. It's having user fees for any type of transportation mode that we have. And then we get a better sense of, where again, where do people actually want to live? How do they actually want to get around? And what are they willing to pay for? What are they willing to pay in order to use these transportation modes? So I think this is this market urbanism take for transportation is an alternative from what we have now. Right now we have a road subsidy paradigm in which we collect gas taxes at the state and the federal level that goes into a big pool, a big pool, like a, it goes to a big bureaucracy and is basically a pool of money 
that they decide how to spend it in a political process. And in often cases, the Federal Transportation Department reallocates money to the state governments. The state governments decide how they're going to spend that money, and it's a very politicized process. The alternative that I'm suggesting is direct user fees on roads. So then you get a sense of, do people actually, like, will this road actually pay for itself? Do pe are people actually willing to use a fee, to pay a fee to use this road? And then you get a sense of, well, was the road properly routed? If they're willing to pay the fee, then yes. But in a lot of cases, we don't have that in, in the United States. Instead, it's more of a tragedy of the commons. Uh, for, for public transportation, it's the same thing. It's why do we have municipal monopolies, or in some cases, regional or state agencies running monopolistic transportation systems that don't have any competition? Why can't we have private transit? And why do we have laws that basically outlaw private transit from functioning in the cities? Why do we have to have these monopolies? And this is the only kind of mass transit that you can use. And so I'm going to be calling for, on one hand, deregulating the laws that prevent private transit, private mass transit companies from functioning. But also, the second, the second tier of the mass transit is radical reform of public transit agencies, or maybe even abolition, because they have proven to be very incompetent at running mass transit in our cities. And, and then, so the third aspect is public administration. Private sector organizational principles are more efficient than public sector ones. City government, government should recognize this by operating more like businesses. And so I think there's multiple ways that a market urbanist could take this. We could say that we have fully private cities that when we want to have a, that if you were to form a city and you were to have public services in that city, you actually contract directly with private companies to provide them. So you have private management for mass transit, you have private management for garbage pickup, street lighting, whatever. I mean, any type of service, you just contract out to private companies. I don't think that's politically realistic in modern cities, but I think a more pragmatic market urbanist reform for our current paradigm in cities would be Rather than just not having a government, why not contract different, why not have P3 public-private partnerships where city governments are contracted out, uh, or city services are contracted out to private companies on performance-based contracts? And we can figure out, does that work better than having a, a unionized municipal bureaucracy that has been there for decades and has proven not to function well? And so. Josh asked me to talk about how some of the different market urbanism ideas might apply to a place like Baltimore, and I think this would be a good example. So, for example, street cleaning. Baltimore has had decrepit street cleaning for decades now, and this is quite evident if you go through the different neighborhoods of the city. Uh, for example, on my block, up in, Ham up in the Hamden area, there is a, on the corner of the block, there is major overgrowth in the sidewalks as far as there's weeds that are now three foot high growing up over the fire hydrant almost up to the stop sign and it extends that way for about 40 feet down the block and this little outcrop here attracts rats and needles and trash and everything and so that's a that that is a sign to me that clearly the city the the public services and maybe like the public works that is responsible for cleaning this area is not doing a very good job and hasn't tended to this specific block in weeks. And yet you see this all over the city. And so I think a market urbanist response to this would be, well, if the city, if the city sanitation isn't going to do its job, maybe you give tax relief to the people paying property taxes. They can use that money to hire a, a private contractor who will actually come in and do the job. And maybe this contractor is affiliated in some way with the city and has some sort of contract that they've signed with the city. But at the end of the day, you need an outside company that has a comparative advantage in these types of services rather than a city monopoly. So I think you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
So I think the overall idea of market urbanism is, on one, I think in the theoretical sense, it is, it is what would a libertarian free market city, how would a libertarian free market city function if you basically had a city that doesn't have regulation and doesn't have any sort of central bureaucracy and is fully functioning on private interests? That's the theoretical side. I think the more pragmatic side would be what are market-oriented reforms that could fit into the existing political context of cities that would be a better alternative than just having the government run anything, everything. And in that sense, the more pragmatic reforms gear around things like reducing zoning laws so that they're not quite as restrictive as they are now, um, experimenting with privatization and mass transit and generally less regulation and mass transit and transportation in general, experimenting with P3 privatization and performance-based contracts for city services. So that's, that's the general idea of market urbanism. And again, I've started the market urbanism report to, to really advance some of these ideas and try to make them more, um, trying to make them scale in the public imagination more and try to make them potentially uh, more politically likely in cities. Yes. Good morning. Okay. Uh, Mike, microphone, please. Mike, Mike, please. Well, I would. Okay. Please. Hold on. Turn on two. Mike, two is down there at the front desk. Two. I have two in my hand. It's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I was going to fill in a little bit for Fred as a respondent, um, and then we'll go to questions. One thing I. We didn't hear anything about land value tax, so before I do anything else, do you have guys have any position on land value tax? Not really. I, will, I mean, I think yes, in the sense that it seems like it's a better alternative to the other types of taxes, like income tax and sales tax. But um, I, don't, I haven't really studied land value tax closely, and I think there are other people who could speak more on it. Um, I, all I can really say is that it seems like a good idea. Yeah, it, um, yeah, I think we, most of us, not maybe not all of us, but I think most of us agree with you about zoning. And we would make the added point that the biggest, the biggest beneficiaries of zoning are people who have monopolized land. That um, zoning, zoning got really oppressive when the suburbs came because there was lots of suburbs and land prices were collapsing in the city and when, if you speculated in the suburbs, once the automobile could take you to anywhere, you had a really difficult time establishing a monopoly in the suburbs for the longest time. But if you zoned the suburbs, it meant anybody who moved to the suburbs had to be rich enough to um, buy up, they, they had to be rich enough to buy whatever the minimum zoning was. So you could not have a lot of small towns in the suburbs. You had to have uh, quarter acre lots or half acre lots. One place in Pittsburgh where the very rich are, you have to have um, almost a five acre lot. And that, that, that enabled the people to grab up land in the suburbs and know that the, the suburban sprawl would reach them sooner because people couldn't minimize their grabbing of suburbs and just to live on. Um, in terms of transportation, I've, George just generally, but I've particularly studied the history of transportation when it was all private, and it never paid for itself through fares where it was an outreach transportation. And the most urban transportation, like the transportation company in Pittsburgh was granted to a company that was owned by the mayor of Pittsburgh. And so the transportation is not, the, the idea that you should pay for transportation uh, by fees makes a lot of sense if you're in an amusement park and you're getting on for the benefit of the ride. The reason we have transportation 
is to make land valuable. Land that is accessible by roads is far more valuable than land that isn't. And the lobbyists for new roads are always the people who bought up land that will be near the interchange or near the end of the new road. So your analysis really needs to have a land speculation component in dealing with whether a road pays for itself. Almost all the roads pay for themselves in higher land values. Well, let, let, let me, let me uh, jump in. Okay. It does. It does. And I think that's why I would support something like value capture. Yeah. Uh, I look at something like what Tokyo does where they're, they're um, actually, excuse me, Hong Kong is the one with MTR, but they do it in Tokyo as well, where the transportation company actually owns a lot of the land around the stations, mm -hmm. and they're actually allowed, because there's less regulation there, to upzone and build specific, uh, very high-density housing that creates a lot of revenue, and then that revenue gets thrown into improving the services. So yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm... Um, I don't like taxes in general, but I, I think the land value tax makes a lot of sense because you are, it's going to, to encourage higher production on that land and then that money can be used to, to funnel into the services. And they're, they're trying to do a, a similar thing in San Francisco now in the Bay Area. BART has finally been given some regulatory approval to develop the areas around their stations. And I think it will have the same effect. You're going to see significant upzoning rather than the parking garages that exist around a lot of BART stations now. And I think that will finally give, that will finally put more money into the service so that it's not this decrepit thing that has rats running around in the subway. I mean, maybe that won't happen because they're, the agency is so um, inefficient with the use of the money. But I would generally think that BART service will improve as a result of. Uh, better using the land around the stations. Yeah, the the, um, the the only difficulty we would have is if if the transportation authority has to purchase the land near the stations in order to capture that value, you end up finding that the speculators will up the price of the purchase before the before the transit authority gets there because they they know what's the, the business of being a, a land speculator is the business of knowing what government's going to do before government has decided to do it and so the idea that we have to buy the land in order to put a transit station there means that we have to pay the land speculators in advance for the added value that we're going to create and maybe because there's an element of speculation, we will create more value and can make a, a profit of that. But land value tax basically says you all have to pay this tax, and if the transit goes in, the taxes, the, your assessment is going to go up, and your ability to rent it out or turn it into apartments is going to go up. And then we just say, do you want the transit and the higher assessment? Or do you not want the transit and want to keep the lower assessment? And then the democratic process benefits correlate to costs. But the main point is that user fees, most of the cost of transit is an overhead cost. It costs just as much to run an empty bus as a full bus, except that the full bus has to stop more often to get people on and off. But the, the user fees should probably pay for that added cost, which is a little bit trivial, on wear and tear on the seats and stopping. But most of the cost is, um, is just you either have a bus running or you don't, and you have the bus running because it will enhance land value. So the, that's our, um, and the third one was private, privatization Privatization works really well when there's competition. When government, when government contracts with the private person, you have all the economic accountability of government and all the political accountability of a private corporation. So there's, what, is this one dying? No, that one dying. <laughs> okay. So, um, 
So you have no accountability at all. No, I think you hit the button by accident. Okay. Okay. No, it, I didn't hit well, the button. So I died. that's that's why I I don't I don't agree that you don't have accountability. I think it that depends on the savviness by which the government has the ability to contract with the private company. That's why I mentioned private-based contracts or, or performance-based. Oh, but I think another alternative to just per, just writing a specific contract between one city government and one company is to lease the general space, like lease curb rights. That would probably be a more, more even an even more market-oriented solution. Is the city government leases certain spaces, like curb rights? within their city that private companies can then come in and bid to use that space. And so that's like proprietary curb rights where you have a curb, you have curb space within a city that a bus could theoretically stop and, and pick up passengers and you lease that space out, the use of that space based on, to, based on the time that different companies are using it and they can come in and just pay a fee. How would that um, how would that work if the if the land values are is this one yeah is it okay how would this work if the land values are being used to subsidize the transit that that is creating the land values? Well, I think that that's what it that's what it would be. That's marginal. I mean, I don't think I don't dispute that that's the way it would work. Okay. But if the, if, the, if the transit is not paying for itself through passengers, fares, but it's paying for itself through the fact that, uh, like, hotels, hotel shuttles, a lot of hotels have free shuttles to the airport, uh -huh. free shuttles to everything around them. And that's a private business, but they don't charge a fare to ride the shuttles. They right. collect higher rent, room rents in the hotels. And okay, that well, that's, the shuttle. that's not quite what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actual private companies who would come in, operate in the city, and they would indeed charge fees for the use of that shuttle. So I'm not talking about employee shuttles where the costs are internalized and the other operations within the company. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying by analogy, if the city realized that land values all over the city are higher if there's free bus service to the different places in the city, how would they be able to do that? I'm not, I'm not suggesting free bus service. Again, I, I, I suggested, well, and I, I don't agree with that principle. I don't think I don't think you should provide things for free. That's why I say you should have use of fees. Okay, so Well, now we're going to have some questions, and I'll be, I'll be the pro your protector and, and moderator. I think Ralph had his hand up. Hello? Thank you for your talk. Uh, now, they have regulations in place right now for the housing, right? And when you de a lot of times when we de deregulate those regulations, we make worse regulations. You know what I'm saying? So I, I want to know like what the what the regulations are now that are in place, and how would actually how would the de deregulation bring better betterness about? I think that's a fair point. Um, a lot of people who want to abolish Euclidean zoning, for example, which is the traditional zoning codes that we've had as early as the 1920s that separated uses and had and basically mandated suburban sprawl style development. A lot of people like from the Congress of New Urbanism want to come in and replace that with form-based codes, which would mandate that you build urban style developments that where the buildings come up to the street without setbacks and everything is sort of mandated in this neo-traditional row house design. I don't agree with any of those concepts. Uh, I think whether or not you like form-based codes or Euclidean codes more depends on whether or not you like sprawl or density more. But at the, at the end of the day, I'm coming from this that 
we shouldn't have these. We shouldn't have either regulatory code. Testing one two three eight. Testing. Can you hear that? Okay. Yeah. okay uh, my question is about uh, if you're going to. It sounds like you're in favor of eliminating the subsidy for transportation for mass transit. So are you also in favor of eliminating the subsidy for automobiles? Gasoline would normally cost uh, $14 a gallon. So uh, you, you want to eliminate, there are about seven subsidies for uh, gasoline and for oil companies and oil and so on. Are you in favor of eliminating all of those and making uh, gasoline $14 a gallon? Not quite. Um, I, I'm certainly for eliminating the subsidies that go directly to oil companies. Absolutely. I actually think that we should eliminate the gas tax and replace it with a user fee toll system that affects the interstates all over the country. So if you, and, and this can be done in a way that would actually not make driving as expensive as that might sound. Uh, Robert Poole of the Reason Foundation has advocated for just that. He said that if we that if we eliminate the gas tax, which is, by the way, outdated, it's not indexed to inflation, and it doesn't take into account the fact that people drive less now. So I think that the gas tax is very outdated in the sense that it doesn't, I think it sets up a poor set of incentives, and it also doesn't generate very much revenue. If we eliminated that and replaced it with a mass tolling system that is electronically tolled and does not have like transaction periods where you have to pay the toll booth, but it's all organized digitally and electronically, that would actually create a fairly cheap system. Uh, Robert Poole summarized it. He said that trips between, say, Baltimore and D.C. would only cost a couple dollars. Trips between San Francisco and Los Angeles might cost 30 or $40, which in the broad scheme of things isn't that, uh, it doesn't seem like that's really increasing the price of driving that much, but it's a much more efficient way to pay for the roads. David Harrell from Chicago. I have a, I'm a part of your Facebook group. I, I really uh, I, I love uh, what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, just for everyone's general consideration, I'd like everyone to write down this title it's called "Privatized Public Transit?" Question mark. And that's a that's an article at the Chicago Reader from 2010, and it goes over the history of private public transit in Chicago private transit in Chicago, and the huge controversies, I'm talking 100 years ago, 120 years ago, and the fact that it was almost, it, it was a violent struggle that went on, and you know, it's, it's good background for anyone to understand, if you read about Detroit, if you read about um, Cleveland, if you read about Chicago, it was, it, was a, it was a huge struggle against these monopolies, and uh, I think that's all, uh, a concern here that when you have a you have a monopoly when you have a public monopoly it can be a challenge when you have a private monopoly then you have another layer um, of protection against competition and this is great history it's, it's very enlightening um, people in Chicago at, in 1898 were wearing hangman's nooses in their little buttonholes because they were so angry at the city council that was going to grant a uh, private streetcar franchise for 99 years. You know? And it tells a lot of the history of how some of that was reversed, how we got public transit in Chicago. Um, so I would just, you know, just for people's consideration, I don't have any further comments right now. Could but you repeat that title? It's, the title is Privatized Public Transit? Question mark, and it's in the Chicago Reader uh, website, 2010. So there you go. Okay, and to, and to add on to that, I'm not, I'm not proposing either public monopolies or private monopolies that sign 99-year leases uh, for the rights to use city space. I'm looking, I'm looking either for short performance-based contracts or I'm looking for an open competitive field where you might lease public space on a very short-term basis uh, to, to operate in the city but you're competing with all kinds of different companies. And so, not just one company. David Triggs from, uh, from the UK. And so we've uh, enjoyed privatization for the last 30, 40 years. <laughs>
and uh, you extensive travels obviously have exposed you to a wide range of experience but you didn't actually refer to all the experiences that you've had in the last uh, two years or whatever, it, whatever your travels are uh, and you must have seen illustrations of public services so called uh, that have been privatized and I wonder what your observations are with regard to the efficacy and costs and implications of the privatization that you've already witnessed. The, uh, and of course I'm coming from uh, the UK and seeing where privatization now has really starting to get a really very bad name as we are seeing the exploitation and lack of services that are frequently associated with privatization and I could refer specifically for example to public water supplies and to sewerage and sewage treatment and the privatization of those have been an abysmal failure as far as the environment is concerned and as far as the services to the public have been concerned. They were all done in the name of efficiency uh, but efficiency has been at the expense of effectiveness and the purpose of all these services is to actually be effective in rendering a service to the community. Um, so I'd just be interested in particularly and rather than debate as there will be plenty of debate about the theory of it what should have been your practical experience of observing it throughout the various travels that you've engaged upon? I think it could be a very mixed bag. Uh, one example of this mixed bag would be charter schools. Uh, some charter schools have been shown to really increase student performance. Some have shown to pretty much flop. But I, I think the, uh, I don't think that necessarily reduces the support for the privatization idea because if you have a charter school that flops and then you could terminate the contract, then that's still, that's still proving to be a better alternative than say having a public monopoly such as public monopoly schools that underperform in perpetuity and can never be fired and can never be fired or terminated and are just there. So I think it's still, I, I think it's still, so that's education. Well, it's just, it's just one example, but there are other examples where privatization does and does not work. Um, Veolia, Veolia, the transportation, the French transportation company that has operated in various cities through contracts, the results are pretty mixed. And so uh, apparently they didn't do very well in New Orleans and weren't much of an improvement over the existing city service. But still, you could fire Veolia if they perform poorly. You can't necessarily fire a public monopoly. So there's that turnover and that response to is this working or is this not working that I think is still a very refreshing asset of privatization. We do, we do have a mechanism, of course, for firing public uh, uh, services. We have elections and we change the jurisdiction that uh, uh, manages them in any sensible arrangement. But I can understand that uh, very frequently that's not the uh, effect here because you've so politicized uh, public services. I'd argue that elections are not as efficient of a turnover mechanism as simply just terminating, being able to terminate contracts and respond to market signals. Okay, could I ask you then more specifically where you've seen the privatization, for example, in the water industry or in the energy industry or in the communications industry or even in the transport industry because it sounds very much to me like uh, in relation to transport, what you're really advocating is toll roads, the toll-toll system, uh, which uh, really fell into major disrepute uh, historically. Uh, but I wonder, do you have any direct experience or observation with regarding, for example, privatization of water or sewerage and sewage treatment? I think the best examples of privatization that I've seen are business improvement districts where different businesses pool money in a given neighborhood and that money is used to pay for private services that the city government either doesn't provide or doesn't provide particularly well. So the Little Italy district in, in San Diego was some, form, was some form of a bid. Uh, other public spaces around the country have been bids and, they're, and 
Miami's Little Havana is now trying to advocate to become a bid. And I think that it seems like, it seems to me, based on my observation, that the services and general cleanliness of the neighborhoods when they're functioning under business improvement districts are a lot nicer than, say, um, as a counterexample, maybe like certain parts of downtown Baltimore where there isn't a lot of public security and there's not a lot of public sanitation because they're not operating under that system. They're just operating under a government system. Do you think it's just possible that some of those public services that you've described could be attributed to the problems associated with them with the inability to collect sufficient public revenue to do the job properly? Because that generally seems to be the observation uh, as it were in the UK. So, so, you're, so you're saying should we, should follow, we follow it following years now of austerity when we've cut back on public revenue and public expenditure uh, the phenomenon that you're describing of course are only too clear but it's not due to the inefficiency or ineffectiveness of the public servants responsible for it it's due to the fact largely that they've been denied the resources because we do not have a adequate system of public revenue. I'd strongly dispute that. I think the taxes are already very high, and taxes are already very high in a lot of cities. And, yeah, ta and taxes are high, but, but, but okay, so taxes are high, therefore revenues are high, and, and yet the revenue is used in efficient. But we're not faulting the uh, what we are here uh, considering is changing the whole tax system. The taxes are high, yet of course we tax people for working. Not surprisingly, we double the cost of providing a doctor or a nurse. We double the cost because we tax people for working. Well, I mean, in the in the UK, I, I in the UK, we're saying the same thing. I think we're, we're saying the same thing. I'm not. No, I'm we're not, not saying the same thing. I'm not thing. disputing. I'm not disputing that we need to have a transfer tax structure that taxes land rather than the more productive. But, but your experience of, is observing how the taxes on production, on labor and the like, uh, have in, inhibited public services. No, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm, what I'm saying is that the government does not lack revenue. In my opinion, a lot of these municipal governments around the, that I'm seeing around the country do not lack revenue and they, have, they already have high taxes, but the revenue gets swindled and it gets misspent. If you look at, if you look at the municipal budgets of a lot of cities around the country, a lot of times 20, 30% of, of the general fund revenue is being distributed to things like public pensions and retirement services. In other words, things that are no longer even adding value to the city. It's just paying workers who in a lot of cases are retired and they're not even living in the city anymore. So that is ipso facto proof in my opinion that governments don't lack revenue, they just don't spend the money correctly. That money that can be used to improve services uh, goes to pensions. And again, to me, this boils down to the innate way that governments function. So they made agreements with those pensioners that, that were often insider unionized deals that happened decades ago. And so that's ipso facto proof that they're not running like businesses, they're not running with efficiency, they're running like political machines. And why would you want to give more money to bureaucracies like that? No, no, no. Yeah. Sorry. No. Sorry. Hi, Scott. Uh, thanks for being here. My name is Morgan, um, and I'm a lot like you. I came to Georgism from a libertarian perspective, and I kind of puts us in an awkward position. But as you're researching the land value tax more, I, I encourage you to look at it as a way to uh, shift uh, the thinking of property rights from one of entitlement to personal responsibility, which I think is a very appealing. Uh, notion, but my question for you is um, regards to zoning. Uh, the city I live in in Vancouver is very heavily zoned and it makes for very a very boring city, like just neighborhoods that are miles of single family homes with no businesses to be seen, you know, kids aren't out playing. Um, so in, uh, in your tour of North America, um, have you seen policies that allow for communities kind of on a small scale to uh, for um, self-determination, I guess, like the power to design your own neighborhood, whether it's gardens or you know zoning or building or or any kind of new ideas that really enhance that sense of community and responsibility. Uh, for the most part, it ends at gardens. <laughs> I mean, no, not really. I mean, I all cities have 
municipal zoning code still. Uh, Houston is the only one that doesn't, the only major city that technically doesn't, but it has all kinds of other regulations that function very similar to zoning. So no, there's not a whole lot of opportunity for neighborhoods who want to uh, develop internally in a way that's counter to what the existing regulatory code demands. I don't see a whole lot of opportunities for that. And it, it sounds like you said Vancouver. I'm in Vancouver, yeah. And I, I guess I, I see the cities that are kind of broken, like Detroit, and Baltimore, and Philly, or, or Pittsburgh, as opportunities for um, that kind of thing, where uh, there's a lot of unused land and people who want to save their cities. So I was just looking, I guess, for ideas. Yeah, well, yeah, two, two things. Uh, one, as uh, much of the support for, uh, I guess, zoning is, is NIMBYism. I'm, I'm from California, and there's a bill uh, introduced in the legislature to overturn locally imposed height restrictions on new building, new construction near a BART station. That vote, that couldn't even get out of committee. That's one thing. That, that AB2923, that actually passed. It did oh, pass. are you talking about SBA27? I'm not sure which one now. Okay. And maybe, it, well, maybe, maybe it's something you passed for recently, but you know, initially couldn't get out of committee. But you have the uh, fight. The other thing is that I, I must say, uh, on this trip, I was driving quite a bit on the New York Thruway. And there is a toll road. Tolls are fairly modest, and actually, I enjoy driving on that much better than any California freeway. Uh, it's uh, everybody, uh, it's something we can learn from. Right, I, I think that's an argument for tolls. Um, you know, when you think about an emergency vehicle in New York City that is transporting somebody to a hospital and trying to save their life, would you rather them try to transport that person on congested roads or uncongested roads? And I think obviously the answer is uncongested. And that really gets to the point of, and, and really makes the argument for things like toll roads and congestion charging is it actually frees up congestion. You pay a little bit more, but you get a better user experience. Scott, uh, I appreciate very much your search for alternatives because cities aren't doing very well now. I'd like to turn to housing. Sure. What we, what is called a housing crisis is really a misnomer. Uh, if you buy a car, the minute you drive it out of the dealer, the, the value goes, starts going down. Even if you keep your new tires and new batteries and so forth, you're not going to sell that uh, car. Uh, the value is going to go down. The same thing happens with the house. We've talked about housing escalation. It's not the house. I had friends who bought homes in Bethesda, Washington, D.C. area for around $20,000 and sold it 30 or 40 years later for close to a million dollars. Was that housing? Did that housing get more valuable? The, the minute they sold it, the buyer tore down the house. So that escalation was 100% land value, and the house was even a negative value. So when you're talking about regulations, you should be looking at the land values that account, we're look, we should be looking for affordable land rather than for affordable housing. It's a misnomer, and I think if you pay more attention to what's happening to the land under those houses, you'll get closer to the solution you're looking for. I think that, that the problem does overlap with regulation, though, in the sense that the land value has been artificially inflated because of the regulation. Uh, I agree with you, it's not fundamentally the house, uh, old houses depreciate in value, like you said, just like cars and all kinds of used furniture or anything that's old. Uh, but I think the land I think the higher land value is directly tied to the regulation and the nimbyism that prevents new housing construction. 
uh, from getting built. In other words, I don't think the land has any fundamental value any more than the housing does. It's the regulatory climate that has been put around the land. We, uh, we only have these two last questions because we're at the end of the time slot. We're actually a little past the end of the time slot, so Lindy and Mike are going to finish the questions. Thanks. I have a fairly short one here. Uh, in general, I think I would uh, share the view of everyone in this group that uh, land values, in large part, constitute a user fee for the provision of public goods and services. Um, and in terms of privatization, do you think that landowners as such do anything to provide the value that they receive when they collect that rent? Yes. Wait, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm not sure if I understood your question. Well, landowners as such, in other words, uh -huh. not as providers of improvements, not as providers of services, but simply as people who have title to locations and resources. Do they provide any value to justify the rent that they collect? No. No, I, I don't think so. And yet, those land values constitute a user fee for public services, don't they? Um, sorry, I don't, I don't speak Henry Georgism per se. So I'm, not I'm not speaking Henry Georgism. I'm speaking just mere economics. I mean, I think that... <laughs> If, if you're talking about, it's, it's well understood and documented that uh -huh. the value of public services and the provision of infrastructure tends to lodge in land values. The whole issue of Absolutely. Value, Absolutely. value capture revolves around that. Yes. So um, if we're talking about a system of privatization based on user fees, et cetera, I think we got to consider land values in that. Otherwise, we're not talking about anything at all. I mean, okay, yeah, yeah, I see what you're, yes, I, I agree with that. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> well, you may you may think that we disagree. Is it on now? Well, I'd I'd actually like him. I'd like to. I'd like for him to extrapolate a little bit more on that. So, how would that? How is what you're talking about? How would that tangibly apply to something like a a, a P3 contract or something? Are are you saying that the that the privatization what exactly are you trying to say? Well, I'm saying in general, once again, in general, I want the uh, value that is created to, uh, to benefit the people that create it and not people who are simply a position to collect it because they own a resource. Okay, then we're, uh, And then I think that yeah. there's an essential tenet of privatization of the efficiency that we can expect from privatization in that logic. You know, I don't want unearned income to, for the provision of public infrastructure to go to people who are just sitting there, which is what we're talking about in terms of the private ownership of land, and particularly in the whole issue of value capture. Value capture for transit is a, is a prime example of that. I'm not sure if what you're describing, though, works in contrast with privatization, because if a private company wants to come in and lease different aspects of the city to be no, able to No, I'm not it, suggesting it works in contrast. I'm saying that your scheme of privatization will only work if this underlying reality is understood and, and effectuated. Well, I think it will be understood intuitively in the prices that the city government would be charging to the private company to, well, it use, now. to use the different facilities. Uh, it, it, we've seen no sign of that up to this moment, I don't think. In other words, to go back to the curb space example, the, curb, the reason the curb space is so, would be so valuable in a place like Washington, D.C. is because of all, the, of all the government investments that have been put into the city to increase the value of that land. So I think that would be re reflected well, in the final price of leasing the curb space. I think we're running out of time, and we can talk about this at length. Let's go to our last question, and thanks. Well, you may think that we disagree with you, but I think okay. that basically we do totally agree with you that the government should be run like a business. And when you think about how governments expend all this money in the streets and the sewers and all the public and services and police and fire, what does it actually do? It doesn't increase wages. It doesn't increase the value of buildings. It doesn't increase the value of all the things you buy in the store. It increases privately held land. So if governments were to run like a business, they would charge all of the landholders the value of the, of the land that they hold, which was created by 
the public investment in all of the things that we hold near and dear. So we do agree with you in ba your basic concept, run the government like a business and charge only for the things <laughs> that, go that the values that government creates. Well, I think to, to get back to the privatization point though, this is exactly why you want privatization. Because if the government has sunk all kinds of uh, value into the, into the land, well, that's not reflected when you have public monopoly services you're because not, you're, because you're public monopoly. Side track here. Well, he's uh, the, he's the one who asked. Side track of, of privatizing <laughs> government services. In, in other words, when of, of when a public bus when a public bus yeah. is functioning on public land that yeah. has been made valuable, they're not. If the, the, public, the, 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 the prices competing, that the public... You want, if you want to have private companies competing, you don't need to, to have to rent them the space. You let every bus stop at that stop. You let taxi cabs run. They don't have to have a, a license. Just be certified as safe, and you've got free enterprise. But how is that capturing the value of the land that we're talking about? It isn't. <laughs> the but person, isn't that the point? You're, that, you're well, charging the private I thought that was the point. land as it increases in yeah, value. We're, we're out of time. Just to, our, our focus is that there's people taking value out of the system and putting nothing in. Your focus is that the private, comp the private bus company might put it in more efficiently than the government bus company. And it might or it might not, but they are, they are putting value in and they're being paid compensated some way for value they're putting in. And we're saying that's a very minor consideration compared to the people who are taking money, taking value out and putting nothing in. But see, this makes the, this makes the exact argument for user fees. Because user fee, the final price of a user fee is going to be reflected in the value that has already been put in the land. In other words, a government that has developed its land. Are, are you saying oh, for, let, let me well, finish, let, let me finish, well, you, you, let me finish. You, I think we understand what you're saying. The question, the real simple question is, should the hotel let private companies charge passengers, charge hotel guests to get around town, or should they have their own hotel service? Because the hotel is like a little government here. I'm, I'm under the rules of the hotel because I'm in their governing jurisdiction. And if, the, if it's more efficient for me to hire a private taxi to get to the airport than for me to use a hotel shuttle, why do so many hotels give free hotel shuttle service? That's, that's the, the analogy. That, but the question that we all have is, would everything you're saying be true if government if the government bus company did capture the value it was creating, if the, um, if the police did capture the value they create. Because we could have private police, but there's some real serious issues with that. So. I didn't say anything about private police. <laughs> I think that this was a sparky little conversation. And, and I see room for outreach and collaboration from each other. It's funny, we, I still believe, we're plowing in the same field, but one's using a farm all and one's using an international harvester. So, so we're going to find a way to meet that. I'd like to thank Scott for uh, coming into the uh, lion's den, and uh, he's done a great job, and I really appreciate it.